Podcast. Welcome to another in our series of total success interviews where I pick the brains of literally some of the most successful icons, both in Australia and internationally. And today I am stoked. This person, this amazing woman, has been on my icon list ever since she came to my attention in the year 2000 when she was interviewed on the Roy and HG show, having won gold at the Sydney 2000 Olympics with her partner Kerry Potthouse. I'm talking about none other than five-time Olympian, gold medalist, best-selling author, you name it, her list of credentials is a mile long. I'm talking about none other than Nat Cook. Natalie, thank you so much for hanging out. Pleasure, Glenn. I couldn't think of a better place to be than having my brain picked with, with you. Well, I tell you, I'm a little bit fanboy right now, right? So you've got to forgive me. But you came to my attention uh, on, on Roy and HG's show when you'd won the thing at the gold in Sydney. But your story kind of starts a, a few years earlier than that since I've studied you and I've heard you speak and all of those things. Um, tell us about... Atlanta, four years earlier, where that journey started that culminated in all the success you've done since. And I can't wait to, to talk about that. But tell us about Atlanta. Well, Roy and HG would be stoked that that's where you saw me, not the Olympics. <laughs> yes, it's well, no, Roy there, but HG. the thing that stands out yeah. was that, that interview. You guys were so good. Oh, and for us, you know, that was the highlight too of was all it? the things that come after the Olympic Games is all the fun stuff and meeting Roy and yeah. HG and being on the show and and inviting friends to come too. But let, let's go back to what you asked about yeah, Atlanta. Atlanta. And mm. it was our first Olympic Games. It was the first time beach volleyball had ever been in the Olympics. Mm. And Kerry and I were pretty new at the sport. We'd played indoor volleyball, Kerry, for a little bit longer, because mm -hmm. she's older, but she'll get really upset <laughs> if I tell you how much. Um, she played a lot of indoor. I played at school where most people learn to play grade eight volleyball, get sore arms. <laughs> and then um, beach volleyball was announced as an Olympic sport. And Kerry and I, through a, a bit of a longer story, we managed to team up for Atlanta. And we really probably had no right to be on the podium. Wow. We, we were there so quickly. We <laughs> rose to our, our pinnacle very quick. Mm -hmm. The Brazilians, the Americans had dominated the sport and they really should have taken out most of the places. Now, Brazil took first and second, and we came third, mm -hmm. beating three American teams. You would have been popular. In America. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, we didn't have many American <laughs> friends after that, but um, it really did open our eyes to what was possible for us, to mm. the fact that, hey, we got really close to this, and, yeah. and being in our home country of Sydney, what could we do? Um, so winning an Olympic bronze medal, you think, you think you're going to be famous, but no one... <laughs> no one cares. As a friend of mine, Kurik, who's yeah. also going to be at the Total Success Summit, said to me, when I first met Kurik, he said, no one remembers who comes second or third at the Olympics. Oh, and, and you're sitting there in an audience going, he's talking about me, that bugger. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly. And I went up to him and I said, hi, Mr Ashley, I'm Natalie Cook. You won't remember me because I came third at the Olympics. <gasps> Oh, really? And that's how our relationship started, and wow. uh, it was a fairy tale from then on. Wow! So tell us about the journey then, um, of what changed? Because we'll talk about maybe some of the application of what you learned in those four years, how you applied that in the moment there in Sydney. But what were some of the tools and tactics that you had to change from being a bronze medalist? You had four years to do so to being a gold medalist. Well, if I could put it simply, it was learning how to stop throwing tantrums when things didn't go right. <laughs> really? You know, like, you train so hard and you have this picture in your head of perfection. And it, uh, if you name one person where it's been perfect, oh, goodness. you know, that's yeah. not going to happen. Let's both learn from them. Yes, let's go, let's go rub their shoulders. <laughs> or, or, But it really, you know, you, you train so hard, you work so hard, you think it's going to go to plan, and when it doesn't, as a bronze medalist, I personally would get really upset, uh -huh. you know. And you'd go into this downward, or I would go into this downward spiral, uh -huh. uh, and I found it really difficult to pull myself out. Whereas the biggest change then was, you know, focusing on what comes next rather than what happened before, uh -huh. and moving on to the next play so that there was no time for the spiral to happen, and it was just clean slate, clean slate, clean slate. Uh -huh. And at the end of the day, that's what really helped us be successful in Sydney. So it was probably, so when you're saying a clean slate, all up here, the skills really physically probably didn't change too much, or certainly you're always improving, 
But because I've often wondered, and you know, that's why I love hanging out with elite athletes like like yourself, because you get to ask these questions. I've often wondered about basketball, about games that are played that fast, and certainly volleyball would be the same. How, when something goes wrong, they have to sn- they must have to snap back in so quickly to be back in 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 the place. Is there a technique that you learned? how to snap back on so that you can just reset? Because for me, when something goes wrong, literally, you could, you could set a stop watching it and go for days sometimes where I'm still, oh, that bloody thing went wrong, whatever that happens to be. Absolutely. Is there a technique that's transferable that, that, uh, that you were taught or did, did you just have something that was untapped that you already had a skill that is kind of inherent in elite sports people? No, no skill. It's trained. <laughs> it's all trained. Patience is trained and mm-hmm. focus is trained. Um, you know, putting your attention onto things, deliberate focus, deliberate concentration. Mm. So the skills probably came from Keurig, mm-hmm. um, definitely came from Keurig, in physical anchoring, you know, a lot right. of when some, you know, whether it's a clap uh-huh. to clear or a click mm-hmm. or I play with my ring oh, okay. and it just sent signals to the brain like, you know, next, next. And, and in the beginning, it was more like, you know, stop it, stop it. But stop it doesn't really help you because if you stop it, then what? Yeah, You know, it was okay. always about what's going to happen next. And it's a shift totally up here. Mm. had nothing to do with our physical skill. Mm-hmm. Um, and on paper, our physical skill probably shouldn't have won us an Olympic. We weren't that good. Wow. <laughs> Say that on camera. That's, yeah. We weren't that technically sound, but we were so strong here and... Between Kerry and I and our belief mm-hmm. in what we were doing, our purpose for why we were doing it, and that we just got on with the next thing. Whereas we could see our Brazilian opponents really like their shoulders would drop, the weight of the world was on them. Actually, that's another strategy is posture. Ah. It's all about that. For me, I use the superhero posture. Uh-huh. Um, Superman never lets the ball hit the ground. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I would often play feeling like Superman, flying like Superman, jumping like Superman, using the superhero archetype yeah, wow. when I played. So. Wow. It's interesting when you talk about your posture was good, you had some physical anchors, because I remember watching those, and I didn't know there was a strategy involved at the time, where you're, you were very animated and physical, and this is in the gold medal match, where you're ramping up the crowd and you're, you're, you're very animated is the word I, w- I would choose. Um, is, is that kind of that physical kind of anchoring that, that you talk about? Yeah, and again, I think everyone's different. So Kerry was really narrow focus. She was like laser focus. Ah. Whereas for me, I needed to build in the story of the whole stadium and not just the stadium, but everybody watching at home. And it was like orchestrating the energy. Wow. Because whether it's good energy or bad energy, it's energy. Mm. So even when the crowd, Sydney was different, but even when I got a crowd that was hostile... I would ramp them (laughs) to make them more hostile because the energy doesn't know whether it's good or bad. Right. So as long (laughs) as you you can tell yourself, trick yourself into thinking that hostile energy is good for you, Mm. then it kind of lifts, it lifted me to a new level. So I loved when 10,000 people at Bondi were on my side and I was like, (laughs) woo, egging them all on and, and it really helped, you know, The motivation, the energy, the excitement, the animation of the Mm. whole show. Wow. And and so there was a time where it wasn't all going to plan during that gold medal match was is is and again, this is what I love about hearing this story is we can apply that in our world. Like when stuff's not going well in my business, in our viewers' business, or whatever the case may be, whether that's a business application or a sporting application. There were moments that I, you know, that you were behind on, on the points. Did your techniques kind of falter or was that just the way of the world and it just fell that way and you had to be strong? Like how was it when it wasn't all going all according to the plan that you'd been so focused on visualising for the last four years? Yeah, well, when you play a sport where you've got opposition, you know, a little bit different to swimming or running, yes, you've got people beside you, but you're running your own race, you're swimming your, in your own lane. When you're competing against others, they want to win too. They, yeah. The got, buggers? They, yeah, how dare they? They've got plans to stuff your plans. Yeah. So when you really sit down and appreciate that, that they're trying to expose our weaknesses, we're trying to expose those theirs, are our strengths strong enough to do that and hold off um, an attack from them? Mm-hmm. Um, and really, you know, there are times where you think, 
even in that gold medal match, oh shit, it's too, it's too far gone. Oh, but what, you'd have to catch yourself mm. because that thought isn't going to help. Yeah. All it does is the tantrum, the rage, the poor me, the victim, all of those frustrations come out. And it's really difficult to dig, set and spike in our case versus even business decisions when we're in a rage. Mm. So we really did work very hard on that focus of it's got, what's gone is gone. What can I do? How do we make it better? Was mm-hmm. a great phrase. Good question. <laughs> how do we make it better? And I did learn very early on that if you're getting the wrong answer to our skill, our sport, our opposition, business, then you're asking the wrong question. Mm-hmm. So instead of asking myself, oh, why did that go to shit? Because <laughs> it'll tell you. you yeah. You, and then that kind of, I'm just thinking, why did it? That kind of says, well, you're going to get a reason and that re- the answer doesn't, even the right answer doesn't help. <laughs> That's right. And the answer is often not what you want to hear. <laughs> so ask, how do I make it better? Mm. And the brain then sorts for the good things that yeah. you can do rather yeah. than the things that you did wrong. Mm. And it's so subtle, you know, it's, it's, Am I moving towards something or am I moving away from? Mm. And, and if I always kept my head going forward, I always focused on the end game, the gold medal prize. How do I get that? How do I get that? How do I get that? Not, what if I lose that? What if I lose that? Mm. It really is quite a, um, a physical trigger that helps build the, the mindset. Wow. And I love how now you've gone on from that success and now you empower and train others like our audience that are coming, going to come and hang out with us uh, uh, at, the, at the Total Success event. Tell us about some of the takeaways that you have that you now utilise these principles to help people in their business, because you're an astute uh, salesperson, uh, property investor, you know, so much of the things. You haven't just lived on that success for the last, what, 15, 17 years now, wow. You've gone on and done some amazing things, continued uh, in, in the sport and in health and fitness and empowering and coaching others. So what are some of your favourite takeaways that the, the crew at our, our event uh, coming up are going to get from, from your session? Well, in, in the session, and, and it's quite unique, Kerry and I don't usually speak on the same stage. You mm-hmm. know, the stage is not normally big enough for both of us. <laughs> so thank you for providing, you know, it's got to hold Arnie first. <laughs> and then um, Kerry and I get to share this space together. We're really nice. excited. Oh, good. Um, we haven't spoken at an event with Curic Ashley before either. Yeah, I heard so this is the first time. It's the first time. So... You know, we're really excited about, Kerry and I will bring um, some stories of our success and everyone knows about goal setting, right? Mm. It's, it's kind of the buzzword, it's kind of the 101 of business, <laughs> Yes. business planning, goal setting, but we're going to bring a whole new spin to that, uh-huh. which has helped us be successful. So. You've got to come along oh, to get that spin. I can't wait. I mean, it is that principle that it does sound so almost 101 and cliche, but I tell you, it was me sitting in events like this that had me write down a goal. One of the speakers asked me something like, what would your goal be if you couldn't fail? Or words to that effect. Mm-hmm. And I wrote down, have Arnold Schwarzenegger headline at one of my events, thinking, but at that time, I, I was given the safety zone if you couldn't fail, if you weren't afraid. So that's a nice, safe place to answer whatever the hell you yeah. want. And now that, and, but then when I come back to the real world and I thought, oh, okay, well, if I couldn't fail, that's what it'd be, but I can fail. Uh, but, and, and now only a few years later, that's twice now we've done it. So. High five. <laughs> and, and yeah, when you, like you said, when you go into the real world, not only your own brain starts to play tricks, mm. but other people. Very much. So part of what Kerry and I'll talk about is that team, mm. you know, the gold medal team you want to put around yourself to help you when the outside forces of realism mm. want to come and cut you off at the knees. Yeah. So and they're doing it with love in mind, aren't they? They're never doing it, well, rarely would someone close to us be doing it with negative intent. They're probably doing it to protect us in some way, but certainly yeah, or, it doesn't help, does it? protect themselves. So, uh, there's perhaps, another, you know, yeah. it's like the crab out of the bucket story mm. and um, mm. uh, the tall poppy syndrome and come back here, it's safer. Yeah. You know, we don't want to see you fall and fail because, so it's all, it, it's quite a unique psychology and, and we'll go into a little bit of that at our session and, and talk about really why, you know, this total success, what does total success mean to everybody in the seats? Yeah. Because everyone will have a different answer. I guarantee there weren't many that would write Arnold Schwarzenegger <laughs> headlining their event, mm. right? And if you'd have found another one in the audience, you'd go, snap, right, it'd be a good game. But yeah. everyone will have a different 
um, yeah. success, what success means to them. Mm. And what Kerry and I want to do is really allow them to walk out of the Total Success Summit feeling like they can, yep. they will, they must, and they have a whole team of support. It's not just them. Wow. My T-shirt literally that I took off this morning to put this one on was I can, I will, I must. <laughs> Literally, because yeah, yeah. Eric Thomas, one of my favourite speakers, uh, uh, I had his shirt on this morning that said exactly Well, that. you got another uh, ET shirt. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan. And, and that, <laughs> I use that because on the court in the Sydney gold medal match, any time there was like, you know, the, the little Thomas the Tank Engine train, I think I can, I think I can, it was I can, I will, I must. Wow, so it was a little mantra you totally had. Totally wow. a mantra. And any time anything, the key with mantras and affirmations, because again, they're kind of 101 to mm. success, but they only, um, they're only any good if you use them. Mm. And you have to use them consistently. And the way I like to use them and the way I like to teach people to use them is they've got to be inserted when a negative thought comes or someone from the outside is trying to sabotage you or you're sabotaging yourself. Insert phrase. It might even not make sense. Yeah. Just insert affirmation because yep. your posture will change, your next action will change, and then your total success will change. Wow. I love how you mentioned your posture affects your mindset and you notice with your competitors that they maybe if they didn't have that, school, that, that skill or that knowledge that they didn't. And it, it, it reminds me, having read everything there is to read about Arnold, how, how he used to do that to his competitors mm. in bodybuilding, in politics. He used to out, almost psych them mm. up here without even physically, you know, there was some great dominating physiques that he was up against many times. And, yeah, it was the brain that ended up winning it for him, not necessarily the most muscular physique. Yeah, well, you, the strength in your muscle is one thing, but it, it is all about this muscle up here mm. and the strength in it. And sometimes it's about laser-like focus. Sometimes it's about endurance. We see our endurance athletes go for a long time. Mm. Um, and I think, like a marathon runner, I'm like, why would you run more than... My volleyball court is eight metres. <laughs> you need to be able to do eight metres. <laughs> eight metres. And even if you break it down even further, because I'm a mathematician, it's really four, because we stand in a little bit, we take a step, we fall over. <laughs> so calculating what it actually takes for you to be successful, because mm. if I thought I had to run eight metres every time, it's only three or four. Yeah. So those little things mm. really make a huge difference. It's like... The analogy of the plane taking off, you know, mm. when it takes off in Brisbane and it's going to California, it never starts on the straight line. It goes mm. off one way and comes, the degree changes and mm. our GPS, will, if we go on the wrong way, it'll say, you turn, you turn, you turn, <laughs> get you back on track. So, so long as you get that gold programmed in program that we're that going in. to Sydney, we are. it'll take you there. We're going wow. to gold. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, can I ask about... How, because you mentioned Kurek Ashley, and again, I've sat in, I've got thousands of hours of listening to you, listening to Kurek, listening to every ET, every success speaker on the planet. Um, other than Kurek, did you go to this sort of event, like the Total Success Summit, where there are speakers like Kurek, or in this case, actually Kurek, and Alan Pease, and um, of course, Arnold, and yourselves, and many, you know, coaches of very, because as you say, different people are going to have different gaps in their world, whatever that might be. Um, what, what's your take, I guess, on personal development and events like this? Other than Kurek's, did they play into your success? Well, Kurek came into my life at a perfect time of um, self-discovery and, and searching for why the capitulation in Atlanta, why, why there were so many tantrums, why we, we should have, could have done a bit better and why didn't we? Mm -hmm. So when that question came up, and that was the question I was asking, which was really the wrong question, but enter, you know, they say when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. <laughs> enter Keurig. We were, um, we spent an intimate two or three years together. On, he would literally stand on the side of the court wow. inserting phrases when he would see my body language change or my posture change or my actions be the wrong ones. He'd be there to... Wow. Right? So, so you wouldn't have always been huggy-kissy that oh, day. No. <laughs> I, I needed Jeff Fennick back then, <laughs> I, but I was a faster runner than him. So oh. if I ever said or did anything, I just <laughs> off I go. But um, he had—he he was amazing for us. He changed everything and made me want to learn more mm. about myself, more mm -hmm. about 
the self-development, more about personal development, because I truly believe you can only grow your wealth or success to the degree you grow yourself. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, if there's something not coming to you in your life, it's because your self-growth has stopped or it's not growing in the right spot. Mm -hmm. um, so Keurig got us to Sydney, got us to the gold medal, and then I explored. I went to a few multi-speaker events. Mm -hmm. I love learning. I love expanding, especially in business, in real estate, in marketing, yeah. in learning Facebook, you know, yep. the new world. Definitely. Um, I resisted that for a while. Really? Thought, no, oh, you can't resist it. It's not gonna... it, it is the media now. I mean, it's the game. It's the know? new game. Yeah. So learn how to play. Mm. And ultimately, that's it. Learn how to play the game. Mm. Um, sometimes, if you want to use basketball, you have to check and block and, mm -hmm. and uh, foul and, you uh -huh. know, that's going to happen in a game. Mm. It's never going to go to plan. But mm. if we can learn how to manage our tantrums, we'll do all right. Wow. You're so centred. You've used the word channeled. I don't know if you used it on camera, but before we started speaking, you used the word channeled. I just find it hard to believe there's a tantrum spitting Nat Cook out there because <laughs> it's very unfamiliar to the energy you predict wow. now. You that predict was nowadays. a long time ago. Remember, 96, mm. where are we? We're 21 years ago. Wow. So that was my youth. You ever going to age? Oh. You look the same. Oh, Serious. I'm flattery, I'm getting you everywhere. <laughs> but I was 21. Yeah, I was wow. 21 and my first Olympics. And so imagine the training leading into that was 18, 19, 20. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, really uh, tantrum. <laughs> yeah, spitter. I suppose we're all a bit that way in our, yeah, in our sure. teams. Think back, Glenn, to <laughs> what you were about. like. Although, no, I was a bit of a... See, I never knew anything about aspiring to success. Um, all my jobs were fun. I worked at a cinema and a, a movie theatre, a pinball parlour, a casino. You know, so all my jobs were parties. Yeah, then yeah. I became a musician. So I had no idea about success. Mm. But then when I was 30, I went to a professional development seminar and uh, a guy handed me a copy of Think and Grow Rich. And uh, the first book actually was The Magic of Thinking Big by David Schwartz. And I tell you, seven odd thousand hours later of studying people like yourself, and you know, I'm a bloke from Ipswich, don't know, don't know okay. <laughs> So any of the kids, the reason we read is for that purpose. Like mm. it all came for me too, self-help books. My mm. first one was Dan Millman, The Way ah, of the Peaceful Warrior. Yeah, wow. You know, yep. then Napoleon Hill, then Robert mm. Kiyosaki and and Anthony Robbins and all yeah. of those things are just, you know, the skill to read and the desire to um, soak it all in and yeah. want to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday yeah. helps us go a long way. And definitely the amount of people that go to those things. Let me finish on this question about when they leave that success summit, because um, certainly I'm coming to you now begging for, uh, you know, health and fitness advice because, you know, you're an icon in that world. And um, so... Talk to us about implementation, because there's a lot of people that go to these sorts of events, but not everyone ends up gold medalist on the podium. Not everyone ends up on the poker invite list at Arnold Schwarzenegger's house, you know? And that, this, is, this isn't kind of for me to brag. This is for me to say, I can't believe it. When I was 16, impersonating Arnold, I, I would have given you a very sizable bet at whatever odds you wanted that this wouldn't happen to me. <laughs> And, and so tell me about, what are your thoughts on implementation? Once we've gotten days worth of information from yourself, from all of those speakers at that event, what's the difference between someone who leaves and takes action and someone who leaves having had a nice time but it doesn't change mm. their world? The multi-billion dollar question. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> and, and it really, I think it's down, you know, we all have this little flame of desire and um, goals and dreams in our belly. And some people will walk out of there and, like, the speakers have just stoked that thing. It's a bushfire. Get out of the way. <laughs> I'm going. And other people, it just almost gets snuffed out. And if you can, if you can give me that answer, mm. and we could write a book, yeah, we, we could change the world. <laughs> we could, yeah. Because, you know, Nike says just do it. I mean, mm. ultimately, part of the reason I think people don't, and it, it may be easier to work on that first to help mm. understand what, why they do, is the overwhelm. Mm. The, oh my God, there's so much, or there's too much to do, or I don't think that can happen. There's no way I can get through that obstacle. All that happens, and it just goes like that to people's brains. What the Total Success Summit does is open their brains, mm -hmm. so at least they walk out there with, I can, I can do this. Yeah. And, and what Kerry and I will talk about is that you, when you surround yourself with a team, so you often turn out to be the sum of the top five people you hang out with. Mm -hmm. 
So some of the reason people don't do it is they're hanging out with the wrong people. You're mm. hanging out with Arnie now, <laughs> right? And, and people Curic along the way. Yeah. You've got to surround yourself with a team of people that are going to uplift, mm -hmm. encourage, and ultimately, when you throw a tantrum, like Curic did to me, whack you across the head. Wow. So oh. that, that's what you've got to build because there's no point going out there with this awesome open heart, open mind, excitement. You go into the real world and the first person you see says, what are you trying to do that for? There's no way you could do that for you. You're mm. stupid. <laughs> and then you go. Yeah. Posture. Posture <laughs> changes completely. Yeah. So yeah. protect your posture, protect your own um, purpose and your own mm. space. Surround yourself with a team. Now I'm giving too many away. You have to come yeah. see us at the Total Success Summit because that's where it's going to get real yeah. and we'll open it all up so that you too might get an invite to poker <laughs> with Glenn Twiddle. Uh, you're on the list, Nat. Thank you <laughs> so much for hanging out today. Dream come true for me both today and, of course, at the event to sit there. I'll be there pen and paper in hand with your session uh, looking for my, my next little part of my journey and I really thank you for helping me thus far even uh, with this goal of getting me from, you know, I'm down 12 kilos so we've got, yeah, baby. <laughs> so yeah. we've got a fair bit more to go but the journey's on well on the well way. Well on the way and yeah. Arnie has <clears throat> threatened you almost. Yeah. So we did gotta, you see that? <laughs> I did see that so we've got to make sure that you have the last laugh. Yeah, that's it. That's and it. Uh, <laughs> thank you for welcoming us into the to the Total Success Summit. We're very excited and I'll be taking notes when you and Naomi open the show. <laughs> nice. So thanks so much again, uh, Natalie Cook. See you there. Uh, folks, there is another uh, dream come true interview for little old Glenn, uh, hanging out with one of the true greats of Australian sport and business, Natalie Cook. So we'll see you there. And until next time, guys. Bye.